Uh, I'm here with Michael Dessen. Michael is a trombonist, composer, improviser, educator, um, and works a lot on telematics, among other things. Uh, is there anything else that should be in that list? Oh, that whatever. That's fine. <laughs> sure. sure. So easy going. Well, um, yeah. yeah, I always start these conversations by asking people about their coffee preferences or if they have, you know, uh, you know, like tea preferences uh, over coffee or any sort of beverage that you have an affinity for. Um, please tell me about it. <laughs> well, I drink green tea and, and okay. oolong tea pretty much every day. That's sort of my thing. Um, there's great places to get it online. There's a great place called Arbor Teas out of Ann Arbor. Okay. It sells organic tea. And then if I'm on the road, I drink coffee because it's hard to find good tea. But, you know, I like coffee too, black coffee, espresso, whatever. But I'm more of a tea person daily. So I don't know. That's, you're making me feel like a celebrity here, John. That's not normally my, <laughs> my thing. No, normally I don't get asked these personal questions. But uh, I just, anyway. I, I feel like, uh, in terms of effectiveness, I can get a lot out of knowing what somebody drinks uh, oh. coffee or tea wise. But uh, when you say psychological green... test, it's like a Rorschach test. Then exactly, like a... yeah. All right, it's the the most visceral window into your soul. So, um, so in terms of green tea, um, are you doing like Japanese green teas or? Uh... Yeah, I like those. I like those a lot. Like get my cha. I really like. You know, I, you're gonna have to. I have to send me a bill later for the therapy if this is gonna. <laughs> tell you things about me I need to know like but yeah I love I love the Japanese green teas and um and I love oolong tea also um there's a Chinese oolong tea that place has it's really good so um I'm not a I don't have a super refined palate I'm not one of those people I'm not that picky but but I like to get the loose leaf organic tea because then you don't deal with the bags and glue mm -hmm. and paper and all the stuff and so. Um, we don't have to talk about tea too much, but do you uh, do you prepare it any particular way, or uh, just in a pot or a guy one? In a or pot, like that? gotta have a pot, yeah, and you gotta get the water temperature right. So about 175 degrees for the green tea, 195 for the oolong. You know, you gotta sort of like dial that in. It's a thing, but um, yeah, I have a I have a glass pot now. They're nice. You can see the color, see through. It's beautiful. Nice. So those are they're making those now. They're cheap. They're good. Cool. Um, I, I, you know, you say that your palate might not be refined or whatever, but I, those are the two best types of teas. So, um, yeah, they're great. They're great. And I'm basing that on my opinion. And uh, you know, so anyway, um, we can talk about some music stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, I came across your playing on this record, Nourishments, uh, that you did with Mark Dresser and others, and. Um, I wasn't aware of the telematic stuff until I checked out your website and it really spoke to me as somebody who's like, you know, like I mentioned to you, I am sort of a failed routing and switching uh, person. And yeah. um, I also was a fairly serious trombonist at one point, but now guitar is my main thing. Um, but this telematic, telematic thing is fascinating. So um, when did you start doing this? And uh, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, um... I got involved with this around 2007, 2008, uh, because I started a job a little bit before that here at UC Irvine. And I got pulled into it by Mark Dresser, uh, who had just gotten pulled into it, as both of us sort of were, by Pauline Oliveros. Okay. Um, Pauline had been, uh, had started working around that time, uh, a year or two before that, in particular with, um, Chris Chafe up at Stanford, and he'd been developing with Juan Pablo Casares this software called Jack Trip. Um, and there were various, I'd say at that time, there were different little tiny groups of people in different parts of the world building out software to take advantage of high speed networks at universities. It wasn't, no one was really working too much at home uh, at that time on real-time playing together because it would have just been too hard over home networks back then um, but in the early 2000s late 90s early 2000s um, networks like what we call here in the united states internet 2 there's different consortiums in different continents usually um, with different names but these high-speed networks became available to people at, at universities and research institutions and so people like Chris Chafe and, and Juan Pablo Casares, they started to figure out like, hey, we could 
we could build some software that just focuses on moving audio as quickly as possible, you know, over these fiber optic networks. So whether it's in within a few hundred miles where you're really trying to play in tight synchrony or across a planet where you're just trying to get the latency down as much as possible. Um, but they were doing it from the start with uncompressed audio to get really good sound quality. Video, of course, is harder. It kind of is, you know, mm -hmm. behind in the sense that it's just more data. So, um, but we started, you know, I, I jumped in pretty early in that field. And for many years, uh, up until the pandemic, it was a real niche. And it builds on work going on throughout the mid and late 20th century. You know, some of the writing I've done on this and I always mention this Paul Robeson concert from 1957 that um, that some people like in the wonderful book by Shauna Redmond, she talks about this and it's been documented. It's a recording you can hear We're using transatlantic phone lines. So, you know, people have been exploring distance music making for a long time. But in the around the early 2000s was when we had access to these networks that really it's another level of, of what you can do. And so that field evolved for, you know, we, we, we got better and better. We did all these things, all these projects we kept because we had the privilege of being at these universities. We thought, mm -hmm. well, we can, we got these amazing networks and we have, you know, uh, concert spaces. It was a little frustrating because we, we couldn't just take it out and go play at a club very easily. You know, the network wasn't there. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of support. The software was difficult to use and not the kind of thing to just plug and play. So we tended to do these projects for a dozen years um, on our campuses, and we did a lot of a lot of things, big and small, over that time. And then the pandemic happened, and um, I gave a ton of interviews about this like, when the pandemic started, and for the first like half of the pandemic, because suddenly it was like we'd had this field where there were just a few dozen people worldwide working on this stuff, you know, and so we all kind of knew who each other were, and it was really it was a tiny little scene because most musicians really didn't care. And we're not that interested you know it wasn't like they thought it was curious and interesting but they they didn't have a reason to really you know get involved and nobody you know people were like well it's all that latency or even if there's not latency like you know it's a lot of work to use the software you need all these special things and so when the pandemic hit suddenly with the lockdown it was like it was like we'd been in this room with a few dozen people working on this sort of niche thing for years and suddenly there were like two thousand people in the room saying what's you been doing how does it work tell me about it so it was like you know it was literally overnight just an explosion of interest and that was great for the field because the tools evolved uh, much more quickly a lot of programmers it's all open source software stuff you know mm -hmm. um the good tools and so you know we've been developing them and using them and getting better at using them and everything but suddenly a lot more people got involved and that helped push some the tools along tools like jack trip expanded in some new directions other tools like sonobus is a great app that this guy jesse chapel developed like just on his own over a year to sort of built it and it's great and so new things came in and and um and also we were suddenly working from home which we weren't used to doing so we had to get used to that real quick mm -hmm. and um figure that out and home networks had gotten better since we'd started doing that. So we never really had to worry about them before, but suddenly there they were and they were better now. And so like we all got, you know, and so it's a deep process now of like figuring out what's possible from home. I don't know how much you want about all the details, but you know, you can use servers on fast networks. You can do peer to peer just with people at home. There's all these different ways of doing this, different apps. There's different, it's hard to sort of summarize, but I've tried to put out materials on this and like just sort of, I do a lot of consulting with people just not so much now, now that we're back and people are vaccinated, no one wants to talk about it anymore. But for like a year, <laughs> I was like constantly on zoom with people saying, Hey, you want to try and rehearse your band? Here's what you can do here. You know, I spent a lot of time just trying to help people out. Um, and that was rewarding just to feel like, okay, we're doing what we can here to help people. But, um, you know, it's not easy work to do. And it, and we did a lot of experiments at the university. I taught, classes and and we ran some like a some jazz combos last year where we did online playing and performing and it went well but it took a lot of work to get it you know dialed in right and to get the equipment to the students and get it working and it's just it's a it's a process so i the final thing i'll say is that there's really two general ways to look at it and one is the people who do what broadly speaking is network music performance that's a term we now use a lot um which just means playing music over the network, any kind of music. So 
like last year, you know, I supported some jazz combos to just play whatever they were working on. It didn't really have anything to do with the network. They were just, they just wanted to play together. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when we talk about telematic music, generally it seems that we're moving towards moving that term, using that term kind of specifically to talk about music that was designed for the network. So I'm also involved mm -hmm. with that. I mean, in other words, network music performance could be like you just want to rehearse your mozart string quartet or your charlie parker tune over the network right. telematic music is really music where like you're doing something intentionally to use the network as a creative medium so that might mean like i mean maybe you want to take the mozart but just like play it in five tempi at the same time or whatever you want to do you know like or or compose pieces of music that that use latency and telematic is also applied to arts like there's telematic theater telematic you know dance i mean just the, using the multi-site networked format in a creative way specifically not just you know trying to use it as a substitute for what we do when we're in person so i'm interested in both of those things i want you know i want to help do kind of work that bridges particularly in the intercultural work i want to do with young people like classes connecting you know students young students high school age here with high school age students in Colombia, for example, we mm -hmm. have this project with some collaborators. So using the network, you know, to do things just to connect people over space is great, but other projects like telematic concerts we do, we write music to think about, okay, maybe at the distance we're at, there's inevitably a little bit of delay, but how can we factor that in to the composing and the playing and do something interesting with it, you know, mm -hmm. um, rhythmically or, you know, texturally. So, um, so those, those are just the two terms, network music performance being the broad category and telematic being more kind of specific as an artistic sort of aesthetic. Um, I'm curious, are you familiar with the, uh, musician Mark Fell? F Fell? F E L? Yeah, just F E L L. No, I don't um, think so. No. He's an electronic musician. He and his son do, um, I guess like networked music performance, uh, since the pandemic, but, um, he has another piece called focal music. And it reminds me of the sort of like using latency as an artistic thing because it's basically like uh, the score is essentially like uh, impulses being sent to musicians through their headphones and then they have to react as quickly as they can. And so then the music becomes about sort of the degree of inaccuracy uh, that everybody has in reaction time. Mm -hmm. So is that the type of thing you're talking about? By using... Yeah, yeah. That's an example. I mean, either, once you start to actually get into it, you realize how vast an area it is when you're you're imagining possibilities right you know uh of what to do with this medium and, and again it's sort of about not just thinking of it as a substitute for how do we play over the network and do what we normally do sitting in a room but instead what is this medium you know how can we make music in it in a new kind of way or what does it mean to make music in it or how do we get inspired by the multi-site format or the latency or any other demand the psychological dimension of what it can mean to like know that you're you're hearing someone you know so so well with such pristine sound great sound quality and really low latency or in some cases no latency but they're hundreds or thousands of miles away you mm -hmm. know um i mean once you get the the limit is really about five or six hundred miles at, at which point you you move beyond the threshold at which we can play without noticing the latency. Um, and that's a whole discussion, you know, about like, but that, about what is latency and, you know, cause there's always latency, but we normally, when we're in the room, we can play up to about 30 feet apart. We don't really have to struggle with it. After that distance, we would actually, even in the same room. And it's like that after about five or 600 miles, there's no way you can, because of the speed of light, you just can't, you can't get it below what it's going to feel like at more than 30 feet. Gotcha. And it, it's more like 80 feet apart or so, but that's actually not, that's the distance. Like if you've been in an opera orchestra and something you're on, you know, there's going to be an 80 foot distance between some people. So it also raises these questions about how musical forms arise always in relationship to space and aesthetics mm. of sound and, and, or the, the constraints of sound within spaces. So, what you just described is, you know, someone thinking about this medium in a compositional way. And there's there's endless kind of possibilities like that you could get into. It's also, what you just mentioned is another aspect of mediating the 
process with um, compositional or performative methods that that really create take advantage of the differential experience is maybe one way to put it like mm. when you're when you're in your own space and everybody's in an individual space you're you're hearing something that might be it might be radically different than what the other people are hearing it might not be you could try to minimize that you could try to get everybody's mix the same and kind of have the same shared experience which is what we do on stage but on stage even we have different experiences. If I'm sitting next to the drums, right, and you're sitting over across the stage next to the piano, you're going to hear something different than me or based on your monitor mix or whatever. We try to minimize that stuff on stage so that we're hearing roughly the same ensemble sound. And you can you can try to minimize those differences when you're in a telematic environment, but you could also embrace them as potential interesting things. Like what if I really hear the drums and barely hear the piano and you have vice versa, you know, like mm -hmm. what would that, what kind of overall creative, you know, sound could that create? And do we like, some people are like, Ooh, why would you want that? But you know, if you start to think outside of a, a just one way of music being experienced and you can imagine there's other ways that, you know, you might experience it as a performer and the audience might experience it. What if you gave an audience a mixer and they could, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can imagine that like from this medium, it kind of like highlights things that, that would be maybe possible in person, but more difficult or just are a natural uh, aspect of the a dimension of the, of the telematic medium. So it brings up all kinds of things, you know, from how you handle latency in, in scoring for ensembles or, or how you actually some people add latency or you know yeah. or digitally process what's going on so that you're hearing someone but it's not actually what they're doing acoustically it's something else you know there's all kinds of it's just like there's a lot of stuff you can do and so it's been interesting during the pan pandemic because you know we were all experimenting with this before but now like again there's just exponentially more people and i'm mm -hmm. seeing all these things online of so and so you know composing a piece for zoom or for the network or for jack trip or whatever and they're all these people doing cool things that like yeah i mean the more people are experimenting the more we're collectively trying to understand what music can be in a telepresent environment and what what one of my course sort of sound bites is like what does music teach us about telepresence and vice versa what can what can working in telepresence reveal to us about our musical practices so it kind of works both ways interesting um this makes me think of like you know the advent of like virtual reality that's coming about and how that's becoming more and more common. And so, I mean, I imagine this will sort of have to be used everywhere in that uh, type of realm, right? Well, yeah, virtual reality and, and you know, that's a whole, that's a related but different thing. And, and it kind of implies a kind of telepresence because normally you want to interact with other people who are experiencing something in real time and they're somewhere else. So there's a there's a telecommunications dimension to it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, we could go way into that. I don't know. There's, I mean, the VR is like a, a, a another huge area right now for exploration. And, and I think light ne like networking technologies and telepresence technologies, you know, the real, the real struggle is to try to figure out how we as artists and just people can engage with these emerging tools because they're going to emerge right. and they're going to get better how can we do I, sorry, I mean to be blunt how can we do this for good not evil you know how can we do this in a way that empowers us to be creative and to to develop more compassionate and equitable uh realities for for humanity and not just to make profits for corporations and right you know, at any cost to civilization. And so, you know, you see these battles playing out constantly and it's a real uh, concern. I think all of us who work with emerging technologies are, you know, in, in one way or another, well, most of the people I work with who are creative artists are really struggling with this question because on the one hand, there's a, there's a lot of money in technology. There's a lot of um, just, you know, I mean, as an example, students who go to school and are studying tech in the arts are going to have an easier time getting jobs, right? There's a lot of, there's just a lot of ways in which like tech has sort of become this juggernaut of, of mm -hmm. economic, you know, 
potential and all this but a lot of us who come i come from an acoustic music background i mean i sort of i do i'm very involved with technology but like i grew up playing acoustic instruments that's my background you know so i can even though i'm not like technophobic i can relate to the people who are sort of looking at all these things going whoa like something's being lost here when all the time we're spending on screens all the time that that we're not just spending on screens but having our own agency sort of taken away from us by these right. tools that like basically tell you what to do you know social media seems so empowering because it connects people but it's got a it's very much about surveilling you and and taking your data all these things right so there's there's all this dark side to it and similarly with all the music tools it's an amazing time for music technology there's incredible stuff out there that's just so empowering but boy if you look around it's amazing how many people are sort of using these tools to you know they come with a lot of prefabricated things that just sort of show you well here's you know it, it's 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 easier than ever to just sort of download some apps and and sound libraries that can you can just sort of slap together a thing and it'll sound like a film score sort of i mean it's like it's not quite the same but like there's so many pre-produced things that actually are bypassing the need for people to really create their own materials and so i i struggle a lot particularly as a, as a professor you know mm -hmm. how do we get students to to really get around that and to really to really get them involved with the the joy and creativity of like building something your own and like actually you know and how do you and how do they even do that in an environment where they're just saturated with all these options and it's hard for them i i, I can really you know see the the struggle because th there's such a pressure to produce professional sounding things um but like you know how do you even do that in this environment without taking advantage of all these things that are sort of handed to you so it's it's really interesting and i don't want to just say everybody should turn off their computers and go pick up a saxophone and learn from that you know but but because computers are great but you know we, we have to figure out a, how to navigate this and i think more and more that's what i'm that's what I'm thinking about when I'm teaching technology and learning it myself, you know, is how do we create a culture where it's empowering to us and not just like taking over our lives and giving us all these, like, you know, <laughs> things we need to just slap together. And we, we become kind of compilers of, of content, you know, um, rather than creating it. So it's a, it's an ongoing challenge. Um, so a soundbite from Jaron Lanier is something about, along the lines of like, uh, you know, acoustic instruments are like the height of technological advancements or something like that. And mm -hmm. I, I think that I appreciate that now. But when I first like, you know, got into like Max MSP or something, I essentially was like, I don't need to play the guitar anymore. Like, and I sort of like, I, I mean, I feel silly about it now, but I sort of was seduced away from my acoustic instrument. And there's something to be said about having a relationship with like an acoustic instrument. Um, and so it seems like you're enabling that experience spatially for more people, but um, it also enhances your ability to like, you know, explore this whole world of telematics. Um, did you ever feel like you, like like your relationship to the trombone was challenged by this or uh, sort of like? Not really, I never felt like it was a problem or a challenge to, I mean, it's the only challenge is time, you know, having time to do everything, you know? that's always a challenge um i've always had a lot of interest i'm never really i feel like I've, i never really could settle in one particular thing i always want to look at all these things and so that's a challenge you know where how do you uh, the challenge of depth versus breadth because right. i also really like depth i like going way into things you know um definitely with trombone i've gone way into it but i love all the technology i love i love reading and writing i love you know composing i mean um all these different areas like improvising um trying to figure out how to how to integrate these different practices is always a challenge but but i never felt like my approach to the try i never felt like oh, i gotta just stop playing trombone it's not good enough anymore because it's it's different it's what it is and and by the way i mean jaron's amazing I i love his writing and and he's always been a you know an inspiration and such a creative thinker um and really presaged a lot of of you know what we're dealing with now i mean he's one of these kind of real visionary thinkers and, um and i can relate to his comment in the sense that 
it's not so much that instruments in i don't know I, I don't know what where that quote is in the context or anything but the way i understand it is you know it's not so much that instruments themselves are you know the design of the instrument i mean some of these instruments are designed they're amazing design but some of them are very very simple design and actually the trombone is an incredibly simple design mm -hmm. so it's not so much about the sophistication of the the design of the trombone is more sophisticated than a max pad it's definitely not right i mean you think of all the things going on in a computer that's like so complicated mm -hmm. trombone's like a garden hose with a bell at the end you know it's like a very simple thing but it it calls into question this idea of what is simple what is complex to begin with right because you can do amazing things with a garden hose forget about the trombone you know i've yeah. i've heard people like you know a couple of sticks do amazing things with their body right so you don't necessarily need the sophistication of the tool is is only one layer of the of the creative process and and so i actually find that the experience of going way deep into a very limited you know tool um I mean, limited is the wrong word, but like something, something like the trombone, it's not limited. It's if you go, if you go way into it, the more you go into it, the more you realize how many possibilities there are. And so if you spent years and years practicing and developing a, a, an art, artistic practice with this, with an instrument like that, you know, then when you go to some other area, like adding a layer of computing processing to it, you have something really rich to build on. So for me, that's been my whole, you know, Digibone uh, practice or extending the trombone with the computer was really about trying to think about, I've got all these things that I've, I've cultivated on the trombone. There's, there's a, the trombone has its own unique kind of qualities, the sort of gradient spectral qualities of the slide and all that. Um, and then there's the things that I personally do as part of my sound how do I get a computer with all of its possibilities to like extend on that? Not just like hit some samples and sounds cool. And I play along with it or not just like add an octave mm -hmm. effect or something, but like what, what kinds of effects can I develop that take as their starting point, these, these particular things about what I'm doing with the instrument articulation and, and timbral things. And like, how can I extend them in a way that really transforms them into something else, but from that foundation, you know right. so for me this is the the integration part it's not just like slap a layer of electronic processing on your instrument and you know I, I would so it's really about and that takes a lot of time to just sit there and poke at things and practice like spending hundreds of hours with a delay effect just trying to figure <laughs> out what that can do for me given my vocabulary as an improviser and the way i hear things and understand form and whatever you could spend you know and there's people who really really studied this and really you can you know see what other people have done you can really check out but you really have to find your own your own practice and voice within that it just takes a lot of time so it's not it's not either or it's just a way to extend its practices i don't know if that answered your question though. yeah i think so and it's a, a perfect segue into the next thing i wanted to ask about which is like this notion of the hyper instrument um and you know i i know that you played with denman maroney on the uh that album i mentioned and he plays the hyper piano. And um, I was reminded of that album because I'm interviewing Bill Sotheris, um, who also has a hyper piano that's distinctly different. Um, and, you know, so I was like two different hyper pianos. Then you have the Digibone, which is like, you know, I, in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, there's also Voyager and like George Lewis. And there's sort of like this, uh, you know, I guess like way of extending your instrument but at a certain point it becomes like an environment or like a like a little like you know ai friend or something like that um how do you think about this idea of like the hyper instrument and extending an instrument versus like creating an environment yeah instrument? well you know as you just mentioned there's all these different ways to approach the computer um is it are you trying to create an artificially intelligent partner that listens to you that's really where voyager you know came from kind of a subjectivity a musical intelligence in a way um and george's work in that respect was just super visionary and, and pioneering because no one in the computer music community was really dealing with that quite so much particularly from an improvised music creative music kind of 
perspective as he was doing way back in the eighties. Um, and now that's become a huge field. A lot of people work in that, you know, and it's much easier to get your feet into that than it, than it was back then when he was right. doing the programming and Fortran or whatever, you know, now there's like max patches you can download and just suddenly the, the computer's listening to you and doing things. So um, not that it's easy. That's a whole, I mean, to really do that is a whole exploration. Um, and it's as much philosophical and conceptual about what are you trying to, what, you know, you're using your sense of musical intelligence to create this other sort of responding partner. What is, what, what is that, you know, about? So that's a whole thing. I haven't gone too deep into that. I've, I, I've done a little bit with that with the help of graduate students, actually, who are better programmers than me, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I hired a couple grads to build me a layer that sort of like listens to me doing what I'm doing and then basically like does all of the switching and turning things on and off choices about my sounds that I would normally do with my hand, you know, um, while I'm playing, like deciding mm -hmm. to go to a different timbre and things like that. It's a little bit like an autopilot mode, but it's nothing like Voyager. I'm not that, it's not that sophisticated at all. Um, but a lot of people are working on things like that. I would say what I've done, the other distinction is that when you talk about extending an instrument, I'm really extending the trombone digitally. Like the trombone is this really slurpy analog instrument. Like it doesn't even have keys. It, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like super super gradient and analog and the computer is a very digital binary machine at, at its core now we think of them as all these you know flashy amazing cool things but at the rock bottom of the computer it's either a zero or a one right? right everything is just a switch the trombone there's no switch it's like it's just like you know it's very gradient so i was always fascinated with that both like sort of as an imaginative conceptual starting point but just as also a reality if you pick up the trombone and you start making sound and it's just like it's all over the place the computer everything is on or off you know so um so i was really interested in that and and then the computer's capacity particularly when you're you're really you know taking it to a more extreme you're not just adding a little delay or mm -hmm. you know reverb or something but you're really granular synthesis or whatever it might be you're really mangling the sound or you're really dissecting certain parts of it um uh and extracting them I was really interested in what like what possibilities might come from that you know turning my sound into a flock of birds or <laughs> you know raindrops or whatever like just like and, and it and i'm really interested in just processing the sound i'm not turning it into midi or anything um i'm just taking audio and like mangling it into something and then seeing what's creatively possible with that to do with that if you're talking about like what's so amazing about denman's piano hyper piano project and I would say very similar to Mark Dresser and his sort of, I don't think he really has quite a, a term for it, like hyper bass, but you know, he's, I mean, he's done something very similar with the bass with these, he's embedded pickups into the fingerboard hmm. and he's done a lot of work. He's has a whole DVD on this called guts where, um, he does a lot with overtones and all these incredible physical resonances that he can get hmm. out of the instrument. But he's for many years, he, he has these pickups that, um, if it, he, first he sort of hung little mics over the top of the of the fretboard, but then um, it's not called a fretboard, whatever it's called, <laughs> fingerboard. Mm -hmm. But then uh, he he embedded tiny mics into into it eventually, and he has them go through a system of where he can control those with a pedal, and they pick up overtones, and then he can kind of mix those overtones with the regular bass and get all these effects. It's amazing. I mean, he's got solo CDs that. Of this it's just it, it's sort of like extending the base and similar to the reason i brought it up is because he and denman have this deep connection in the sense that what both what both of them are doing they're not using any digital there's no digital stuff in there mm -hmm. they're not using a computer to do anything they're capturing the overtones and potentials just acoustic potentials of the instrument and using analog microphone technology basically to to capture to do something similar in the sense that they're they're sort of extracting out certain overtones, you know, to use, and then whether it's through Denman's objects or Mark's mics and pedals, they're kind of like taking, you know, those per very particular 
dimensions of the sound and amplifying them mixing them with the other scent it's a it's it's amazing what they've i mean it's a deep kind of process of researching and trying to figure out what you can do mm -hmm. um and they've both done it for like literally decades to, to get this very unique kind of individual practice um so there's lots of other people who do these kinds of things with just like the sonic potentials of their instrument my digibone stuff is more in another category because it's sending the it, you're, you once you start using a computer I mean, all bets are off. You could do anything. You could like right. the computer can really, you've already translated into digital data, right? So you've made that conversion to where suddenly the computer is capturing the sound and recognizing it as a whole bunch of numbers. And then you can mangle it in all kinds of other ways. And, and, and you know, it comes out in all kinds of other ways. You, it's just a whole nother, it's a different kind of, I see it as a slightly different practice, but it's related in terms of the method that you're just sort of like, continually using trial and error to get it a certain sound and and figure out what to do with that musically in terms of form and how to improvise with it how to interact with people how to kind of control it but also surprise yourself sometimes you know and 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 uh it's a there's definitely overlaps but i would kind of classify things maybe a little bit like that mm -hmm. and then there's the composing side i mean i've also done algorithmic composition the screen-based scores where you know you're using screens to display scores that aren't necessarily linear and aren't predictable, but materials appear in different combinations, different pacing. A lot of people are doing, you know, generative scores where there's not even a score until you start playing and then it just starts becoming created based on some algorithm. So there's, a, you know, so many ways, it's really vast all the ways you can use computers to sort of either extend on the practices we normally use or just create pretty radically new ones and um and i've always been interested in that but then there's these people like denman and mark who are really working more in an acoustic realm but have these amazing ears and a similar like curiosity about integrating these extensions of their instruments so there's overlap but differences i'd say interesting um uh, I'm glad to hear that you have done algorithmic composition. Uh, one of the projects I'm working on is this like death metal algorithmic project called the Limitivist, um, after a limitive materialism. Uh, but I've basically gotten as far as like generating novel sort of like structures and forms. And I'm like currently in the process of, of trying to like figure out the pitch content uh, with like in an aleatoric way to take myself out of the equation essentially. But who who do you think are some of the most interesting people in that realm right now of algorithmic Ooh, composition? That's a good question. I don't know if I have great names to offer, but I mean, there's just so many or institutes or any sort of like yeah. Scenes. Well, you know, there's one thing that you might want to check out that I'd recommend people check out and just play with is Magenta. Okay. Um, Magenta is basically it's a it's a Google research group that created. I mean now people are using the term machine learning more than ai i i find that more people are relating to the term machine. i mean there's just slightly different things but um you know artificial intelligence 10 15 20 years ago that's what we were all talking about now it's machine learning um whatever you call it the idea that you can have machines that sort of like you know the computer is learning based on input data that you feed it and then it can like generate things related to that this has been going on a long time of course in music and and you know some people hate it and think it's like why would you do that i want to i want to sit there with my piano and have the ideas come through me but then that you know great go do it there's no you know no one's preventing you from doing that but it's really interesting when you think about what what if i could feed i mean like there's this guy david cope who got into a lot of trouble with people because he was sort of he kind of wanted to do that. He's one of these sort of like he was taught at UC Santa Cruz for many years. And he did these projects where he would, you know, feed like hundreds and hundreds of Bach corrals into a computer program. And basically he, he created this tool that basically like could generate a Bach corral and basically fool you because it, it had studied all the Bach corrals and it's a computer program. So, you know, and then he'd, he'd like go out and record them with a choir and then you know piss people off and everybody would jump up and down about it but it's really not that i mean you know when you think about it computers are just studying that vocabulary right that's mm -hmm. just sort of so it's important i think to understand that there's a difference between a computer you know absorbing like 
500 Bach chorales to learn the voice leading patterns and then just generating one that's kind of like that. A computer is pretty good about that. A computer can generate text now, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the Guardian had a piece last year written by a computer, basically, and it was like an editorial saying, hey, I'm a computer. I'm writing this. You know, I was tasked to do this. And, you know, the, on, on the topic of our computer is going to destroy humans. And it was an interesting little piece mm -hmm. because it was really well written and it drew on, you know, imagine all this stuff online it can just like scan and absorb and so machines are becoming very intelligent and the question is more for me like where is that intelligence coming from it's coming from stuff that we feed into them right that where mm -hmm. we allow them to scour off the internet which is scary and it's why you know it's why so many of these machines end up being racist is because people yeah. are so they you know like, there's all these problems but to get back to your thing you know what magenta does it's very interesting the Google lab people, this group Magenta, they came up, they basically wanted to come up with some ways to apply these ideas that had been in, in like the max world and people who are working on AI machine learning type, you know, approaches to music making for many, many years. It's been around for a long time, but they, they wanted to come up with a way to sort of like create a, a system that anyone could download and use. So it's a freestanding system that you can just use on its own, but it's also importantly, they made it as a series of plugins for Ableton Live, which is very cool because mm -hmm. like someone who, you know, is good at live and is making beats and whatever, and doesn't know much about, doesn't know anything about machine learning. Mm -hmm. You can download this, these plugins, you know? And for example, you could take some of your MIDI files with the beats and harmonies and stuff you've made you stick the magenta plugin in there and you tell it, okay, check out what I've done. Generate like five new loops based on this one that I wrote. And it's going to analyze, you know, kind of like David Cope saying, it's going to sort of analyze your vocabulary and spin out some variations. Now that's not actually such a difficult thing to do in a certain way. I mean, it's actually really hard to get a computer to do that well, but like if you're a good musician, you have the skill to do that. Like if you gave me, Mm -hmm. one of your melodies or harmonies or beats and gave me 10 minutes i could like write something kind of like it and give it back to you and i'd be doing what that computer program does but the fact of having that as an ableton plugin that anybody could use is kind of amazing you know right, yeah. so that's a resource that some musicians might be horrified by you know the same people that were pissed at david cope but if you think about it you know as a tool as a potential what could you do with that like maybe you're you're gonna actually find some new direct instead of just using it to save you time and be like well i made this cool beat i'm gonna feed it to magenta and it's gonna make 10 more for my other 10 tracks so i don't have to do it that's stu that's lazy and boring and stupid but if you're creative and you're actually thinking wow what if i were to like take you know something i wrote and something some other people wrote and kind of mash it up or take something red do something totally random and like stick it in there and see what it does with that and maybe chop out a middle part of it that I kind of like and feed it back. I mean, it, you know, if you if you think about using these tools in creative ways, just I think that's really what I've learned from from my teachers is that there's not this um, you don't have to sort of take sides in these things. You can use very kind of almost mathematical kinds of procedures to music making. And that's what computers are great at but you can use them in very creative ways. And I always tell my students the example of, you know, one of my teachers, Yusef Latif, he was amazing in this respect. I mean, he would, he would like give me these very kind of nerdy assignments, you know, go, go write a four part chorale where the soprano voice is in the octatonic scale. The alto voice is in the mixolydian scale. Hmm. The tenor voice has only intervals of perfect fourth and a minor second between it. And the bass voice do whatever you want he'd say i'd like, come back next week and i'd like show him this thing and he'd be like interesting and then he would model for me how this kind of approach basically would it was something that he he used to generate creative moments and get inspired because as he would put it he had to write every day he had to write a certain number of measures in his music every day and sometimes you're just not maybe if you're feeling it great you sit down and write but it, maybe sometimes you need to kind of get moving so he would like take a chord i wrote and he'd say oh that's interesting so you got like a perfect fourth minor six minor third there and then you got a perfect fifth on the bottom what if we were to turn that upside down and he'd reverse the intervals and play it or maybe what if we were to 
do this and then on the next chord we shift the upper intervals by a minor third what if we and then within like a moment he'd be just off into some like he'd be just in it like here he'd hear something he'd hear some things that were like ah, ah, and then he'd hit on something and be like oh well, that's interesting and then like he'd just start zoning out and like going into this sound and like really feeling something and that would get him into and he'd like play something amazing <laughs> like mm -hmm. just come up with a chord progression that was like wow that sounds amazing like wow, I, I gotta write that down you know and it was like he showed me that you don't have to it was this real integrated left brain right brain thing he, he showed me that you don't have to you know be uptight about well i'm gonna come up with this amazing system and use it and it's gonna generate everything that's perfect because it's a great system mm -hmm. no it's just a system but you also don't have to be like no, I don't think in terms of numbers, I'm just waiting for the inspiration to flow through me. No, you don't have to be like that either. You right. can you can draw on all these methodologies of like creating work. Sometimes you just feel something and it comes right out. Sometimes you need some structure to grapple with and or or go way into and build something amazing. But there's this kind of he had this ability to flow across all of these ways of working. And it was just totally integrated. It wasn't like it wasn't like even flowing across different ways of working. It was just like for him, it was just like there's all these entry points into music, and and they just were like, great, no problem. I'll do that now. I'll do that now. I, that, that's curious. He was interested in. He would come back from like he was taking like in his seventies. He was taking classes at the university on like biology and stuff, and he would awesome. come in one week saying like, you know, we learned about endophytic development of of cells and i'm thinking about like harmony and like how that might be applied to a chord like if I, and i'm like wow this guy i mean he just his, his mind was just amazing and he'd spent you know 60 years by that point developing this very integrative practice where where it wasn't just a single formula or method but it was like he just had this curiosity about the universe and everything fed into this creative expression and so and he, there, were, there were no barriers so that was really that really changed me like in my in my mid late 20s to encounter him and sort of you know i'm still trying to live up to the, the model and yeah, figure definitely. out how to how to create that way but i definitely on a, on a more like practical tip check out magenta it's a fun thing to play around with i've only done it a little bit but i thought it was pretty well designed Awesome. Um, I'm going to look into it. Um, I, hearing you talk about, you know, sort of like integrating elements from biology and that type of thing. Um, I'm curious just about your intellectual interests outside of music. Like, uh, uh, I mean, you you mentioned that you're really into breadth as well as depth. So like, uh, what are some of the other uh, things that you're interested in? That's a good question. Well, completely outside of music, I guess I would say, um, even though my math is not up to it all, I really love reading about experimental physics and like, you know, string theory, things like that. Cool. Uh, I find it really fascinating. Um, Are you a many worlds person or? A, yeah, a actually, person? I'm kind of a many worlds person, you know, about it. So I'm, I, I really am not. I have a hard time retaining all the details, mm -hmm. you know um my wife my partner and i we're, we're like deep into this stuff but we we suck at retaining all the like the information and our math skills are not there but it's fascinating you know and there's so many good people now kind of translating that that kind of um research for lay people like us so i found that to be really you know rewarding actually to listen to and it, it's also in a weird way it's kind of um it's kind of therapeutic in this moment where there's just so much pain and injustice in the world, as well as the climate crisis. And there's just so much mm -hmm. heaviness to what we're dealing with. And these feelings of like, you know, no matter how hard you work and what you try to do, that just feels almost insurmountable, all these problems facing humanity. And so to go and read and, and listen, you know, to people talking about these incredible questions that are arising about the nature of reality and the universe is somehow incredibly important you know more and more um so that kind of area is one um another even though i'm equally like failure at it would be buddhism uh, early in yeah. my life i got very involved with reading and studying buddhism practicing meditation particularly through i guess i would say soto zen tradition so that that you know has been a part of my life but i'm not religious about it and i'm mm -hmm. terrible at you know living up to it and you know but but it's a definitely an area where you know 
an ongoing, I'd say, abiding interest in terms of philosophy and theory. And then, you know, I, most of the reading that I do is actually somehow related to my work in music because even there, I'm just, I've always been fascinated with a lot of writing about music, you know, not just any any one um, discipline, but I'm interested in sort of the sociology of music, cultural studies, and also more social sciences kind of approaches. Um, and as well as, you know, traditional kinds of musicology, ethnomusicology and all that stuff. Um, you know, I, I did a PhD and so that got me deep into all the reading, writing stuff. And I'm not really primarily a scholar, but I'm coming back to doing more writing these days because, um, for a lot of reasons, but, you know, it feels like something kind of important to to get back into my practice after many years of it being on a way back burner. Um, and so there's so much interesting stuff going on in music scholarship. Um, uh, it's hard to even know where to start, but it's, it's been a lot has accumulated, you know, over the years. And, mm -hmm. and there's really a lot, um, a lot of room there. If I know that for a lot of people, a lot of musicians find it hard to find a way into that because the writing, coming out of academia particularly it's academic you know and mm -hmm. it's a lot there's a lot of barriers into how just built into how people are writing that if you're not used to reading that kind of work you know um you it just it, if it's hard to just get through reading it then you can't get to the good part of what it means to <laughs> you and you know kind of like enjoying the the playfulness of someone's voice or the real nuances and ideas if you're just struggling to follow it so i can relate to that but um but because that's a skill I, I developed early on of just reading this academic stuff and it's not after it's like you know it's like anything else after a while you listen to so-called complex music and it's like oh it's just music it's not not complex anymore it's just music uh or simple music is complex you know mm -hmm. a simple song can be very complex um and that's how i think about writing too like it's not it's not difficult to read these musicological articles so I can enjoy what's actually in them, you know, and not be pissed that they're not writing in a more like direct, accessible way, because sometimes they should, honestly, but sometimes what they're saying is hard to do in that direct, accessible way. So it kind of depends. Like there, you know, there are people who write, I mean, like Fred Moten or whatever. You can't you can't write a, a version of a Fred Moten essay on music or whatever. He's, he's a poet philosopher. There's no there's no like cliff notes to Fred Moten. I mean, the right the beauty of the writing is in how he writes and like the nuances of the ideas. You just can't you can't get that any other way. You're not mm -hmm. going to have like, here's the boring version so that you can just get the point. You know, it's, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, I enjoy a lot of kinds of writing about music and uh, including, you know, historical writing, analytical, philosophical, all sorts of stuff. Um, but, yeah, it's hard to find the time to keep up with it all. You know, is there any place that you go to like get curation for your reading material or uh your any sort of like place where you know you hear about good books to read that's a good question i a lot of it is just from people i know you know sharing information but um and i mean being an academic i tend to get a lot of emails from academic presses so i see like latest books on this and that and thing i don't keep up with it all but you know there's a lot of that you're just kind of in these circles but that's a good question about where would you find these cool things? I mean, there's some really cool journals. Like, um, I don't know if you know the trumpet player, Nate Woolley, you know, he's running this journal called sound America and he's try he's a real writer. He's trying to really sort of bridge the experimental music community with the writing side of things and really kind of generate texts of, that, that come from the more experimental music community. Um, so there's interesting stuff that he's tapped into and he's bringing people like that in. there's wow where would you look um god i gotta think on that that's a good question I, i'm trying to think of like a single place and it's hard to come up with something but you know in, in part of what grad students have to figure out how to do when they come into grad school is like get a lay of the land in terms of okay the ethnomusicology people what, what kind of writing do they do where do they publish they're in this journal and they're you know mm -hmm. and then the musicology people and then the cultural studies people who write on music are sort of all over the place but where do you like where are some books that would be like key books to know about that kind of so i do sometimes you know 
I create syllabi and things where I'm trying to like throw a lot of stuff at people just to sort of see what sticks for them. And, mm -hmm. you know, but honestly, it's hard because now it's, it's so overwhelming. There's so much out there and um, everybody kind of has to find what excites them based on their interests, whether they're in academia or not. Mm -hmm. And that's really why it's such a good question you just asked is because like the, the challenge I think particularly the younger generations now have is how do you navigate this information overload we're all in the middle of like where do you like you know and it's the same with music like where do you find new and creative music yeah. you know if you're not in networks of people i mean even if you are i mean i'm in some really creative networks of people so i just look around who my what my friends are putting out and there's some amazing music there and the stuff that they're recommending and you know I'm terrible at social media. I'm barely there, but like I, I have an account so I can kind of see what's going on a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I get a lot of it from that, but even there, like there's an insularity to that. Like I can't just depend on, on the people I know, you know, I have to actually go out sometimes and dig and see. So sometimes I don't know if this is a, a useful skill, but sometimes I'll just force myself to like go to Apple music or Spotify or whatever, and like dig into some areas where like there's, I've never been there. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I don't, you know, look at the Mexican Banda scene, like what's happening there? Who's like putting out the, cause there's amazing stuff that you can learn from or in all these areas. And I'm really, you know, but this idea that we listen to everything, we listen to so many kinds of music, it's harder and harder to sustain that pretense when, you know, the world is so vast. It was, it was a lot easier to say that 40 years ago when, mm -hmm. We were talking about a record store. You could like browse around a few hours, you'd see a little bit of everything. But now it's like, it's a it's an infinite, you know, black hole of possibility. So, um, but I would say a combination of of looking to build networks of people that have shared interests, and that will, and continually having these conversations where people kind of push you to new things, and you know, but also finding even artificial ways to push yourself outside of your normal listening zone and digging for stuff and finding people who are real good at that kind of curation you know like a lot of that happens naturally if you're in circles of creative people like you know i have this trio we haven't played much in the past few years but um with dan weiss and chris tordini these mm -hmm. guys are amazing they listen to all this incredible stuff you know so when we go on tour I would come home with like lists of stuff. They'd be like, oh, you heard of this? You heard of that? Let me put that one on the van. Let me put that. Be like, whoa, you guys are like pointing me to all this stuff that I'd never heard before, you know, new bands, new stuff. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is just hanging with people that are creative and listening to stuff that's different than you. Um, you know, so we could do that all day. I'd love to hear what <laughs> you're listening to. But, For sure. Um, yeah. Well, we're at uh, four o'clock, so I want to respect your uh, time. Uh, is there any you know website or anything that you direct people to besides your homepage? I just I put everything on my site. I kind of it's just a big like archive of all the stuff I do. I try to share a lot of information there. So if anybody's interested in what I do, it's all there. That's my clearinghouse of all <laughs> the stuff. Um, but you know, I'd say uh, yeah, if anybody, I, I don't know who watches these things but you know i'm always open Neither to hearing from people and so you know my i put up my email there i'm on vaguely on facebook i don't really participate much but i'm there um so you know i'm i'm around and we have this cool graduate program here called integrated composition improvisation and technology with a bunch of amazing phd students and i got these great colleagues here um Chris Dobrin, Ko Umazaki, Mari Kamura, and Rajna Swaminathan. And so we have this really wild, you know, interesting newish kind of PhD program. So if people are interested in that kind of thing, you know, I'm happy to get emails and point them. And, you know, like all of us, I'm limited in, in time. So, but I can at least, if I can't meet with everybody who's interested, I can point them to resources uh, for a program like that. Or I'm, I, you know, I try to respond to emails and things, even if I can just have to be brief, but, um, but yeah, I'm happy to, you know, be in touch with people if, if I can be of help and awesome. to the extent that I have time. And I'm sorry that I, you know, um, 
I don't have more time, but but this was no great. Way. And I don't know if that's what you, you wanted, uh, but it seemed like a fairly open podcast thing you do yeah. here, John. It's cool. I so mean, thank and thank you for doing this with people. It looks great. That you're... My pleasure. Um, and yeah, I, I'm super fascinated by a lot of what you said, and I, I want to dive deeper into a lot of it, but um, for another time. <laughs> great. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, keep me posted. I'll keep an eye out for the for your series, and and thanks for doing it. I I, I appreciate anyone who's trying to build community like that and you know, get information out there. So thanks for having me. Yeah. And well, uh, Michael Desson, thanks for joining me. Uh, see you next time. Thank you, John. Bye-bye.